<laughs> Thanks very much, Brendan, and uh, good morning. Um, it is really an honour for me to be asked to speak at this great uh, event today, and I thank Brendan for the invitation for organising it. I also thank Novartis for supporting it, and they didn't ask me yet, but I have my bank de details with me, so, <laughs> so for that large cheque that I'm sure is coming my way later on, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to facilitate that. That's a joke, obviously. Uh, <laughs> and hi, Michael, wherever you are. Um, so uh, I, Brendan asked me to talk about real-world uh, evidence in, and to give an example. And for the last five years, we've been trying to do exactly this kind of work in my own clinic. I, I treat mainly prostate cancer with radiotherapy and uh, become quite passionate in the last five years about outcomes and measuring them and trying to measure the outcomes that I think um, actually are important to patients. Um, and I think it dovetails very nicely what Mary was talking about. It's absolutely key that we get our processes correct in our healthcare system uh, to get the most out of the resources we have. But I, I don't think we can stop there. I think we have to uh, go right through the full cycle to actually measure what patients are interested in, which is their outcome ultimately and their medical outcomes. Because actually, it, although patients want to be in and they want to have access and they want to be through the system very efficiently, in the end of the day, what they really want is to do well with whatever treatment they're having. So how do we do that and how do we join that, that, uh, that thinking? So I, I suppose we're all charged, and the buzzwords now in healthcare, everybody's talking about patient-centered care, and I think it's absolutely appropriate. O over the last number of decades, we appear to have forgotten about the patient and put them often to one side, getting more concerned with running our businesses and running our, our systems, and maybe less about what's the patient actually experiencing. But what does that really mean, patient-centered care? Uh, we're all talking about, but what is it? And then various policy iterations have come up in the last number of years, and, and the most recent one that we don't hear too much about in the, in the last year or so, but a few years ago, as in two or three years ago, money was to follow the patient. Um, it sounded to me like a very good idea, but I, I also would ask the question, on what basis should the money follow the patient? Is it on the basis that it should go to a facility that's struggling to keep up with access, or is it on the basis that it should go to the facility that's our facilities that are providing the best care? And how do we know what's, what's good care? And then you come to an issue which we don't tackle very much, but patients really want to know. I mean, the, the dirty little secret in, in medicine is that when somebody gets sick, they usually will make a phone call or two to somebody in the healthcare system. And they'll say, OK, now I have to have this done. Who do I go to? I mean, wh where should I take this, this, uh, this treatment? And, and, uh, and how does a patient actually figure that out? Is there not any way that I know of in the system to really have the patient judge the quality of what's available uh, to them in the system? So I'm going to try and use prostate cancer as an example and in the next 20 minutes maybe walk you through some of this work and see if you think it has merit. And I, I realize I'm, I'm a physician talking to health economists about a health economic topic. So I know I'm on pretty thin ice here. And I really do welcome your comments. Um, Nice ones, I hope, afterwards, but, but just to tell us, are we on the right track here? Because this is really a bit of an adventure for us. So what are we measuring globally? And Mary's given a good example in, in our, our hospital system uh, of, of KPIs and, and of, of, of uh, process-related metrics that are absolutely critical, and I, I really want to emphasize that. But if you look globally, and this is a, a, a slide from Michael Porter in, um, in Boston, and he, he points out that the National Quality Forum analyzed this me measuring uh, phase that we're in right now and uh, pointed out that of nearly 700 measurements that the NQF were tracking, um, only 200 of them had anything to do with patient outcomes. And when you looked at those 200, in fact, only about 100 actually measured outcomes that were important to patients. So really, although we're measuring lots of stuff, are we really measuring stuff that's going to help us in this regard? Uh, any, from anyone or for anyone who's not from Ireland, the cancer services here are, are organized uh, under the care of the, na or the auspices of the National Cancer Control Program, and uh, you know, which has been a wonderful addition to our uh, uh, health services in terms of putting structure around what we're doing. But if you look in the NCCP around prostate cancer, what are we actually measuring for radiotherapy? And you see, in, under the quality guideline, you, get, um, you come to access uh, me metrics, and I'm sorry, it's hard, possibly hard to read that. And under the quality of care, you're talking about, for example, we want to track that at least 95% of our patients commencing a new systemic, i.e. chemotherapy, in the day ward setting should have a histology, which is a cancer 
uh, pathology diagnosis on the chart at the time of treatment. Now, I wouldn't argue that isn't important. It certainly is. But again, how does that help a patient figure out whether they're in the right place for treatment? So I think we're on the starting down the path of measuring quality, but I, I would argue we're, we're, we're really at the very beginning of it. So let's look at prostate cancer, why it's a very common condition. It's the commonest male malignancy. Almost 3,000 newly diagnosed cases in Ireland, um, which is the highest incidence in Europe, incidentally. Um, and in fact, in the, the, there's an odd geographic distribution, which I hope you can kind of see there. The blue areas are areas of high incidence, and the green areas are areas of low incidence. So for some reason, we have a skewed distribution of prostate cancer in the country, which I don't understand. And incidentally, Galway has the highest uh, rate uh, county by county. So we're uh, literally awash in prostate cancer right now. We have patients. I, in, when I worked in both GUH and the Galway Clinic, it wasn't unusual for me to see 15 new prostate cancers a week in my, in my practice, which is an, an extraordinary number. When you, when you diagnose prostate cancers in that number, the, um, it's an, it has a huge impact on the, on the budget in the country. And a recent uh, submission by Rachelle Burns, and we were involved in this uh, analysis, estimated that about 45 million uh, is spent on prostate cancer every year in the country. Uh, so it's a big ticket item for the country, and it's a big uh, and important item for men. And when you diagnose it early, uh, it's a bit bewildering for men because there's a whole rave of options. You can have no treatment, active surveillance, because we judge your cancer so early it's not going to kill you and you can wait. Or you can have active open surgery, or you could have some type of radiotherapy, which is what I do, and other um, uh, less uh, performed um, uh, treatment. So how does a patient know which is right for them and which is best? How do they judge the value of surgery versus radiation? How do they judge where they should have their treatment. Um, how does the government know whether it should be supporting a surgical program over a radiation program or some other program? Uh, what's the overall impact on the, on the population health when they support programs uh, versus the other? And how do the regulators know which programs are actually doing the right thing and which programs need help? So just uh, everybody approaches this in our business from a different perspective. Now, this is a, an, an odd slide to put up, but I just showed it because it's where we are in the medical field judging the value of various treatments, one versus the other. And just very quickly, to, to there's very little level one evidence to guide us in this, um, in this particular situation. So there's very few randomized controlled trials. Much of what we do is physician-driven. And if you look at the outcomes for the different kinds of treatment in prostate cancer, and, and you look at it in this slide here, we're on the y-axis you have the remission rate, 100% being full cure remission, and on the x-axis you have time, and this is in years, you see that the different dots represent different remission rates from different modes of treatment. And in brief, the brachytherapy radiation, which I'll talk about today, is clustered in that blue mode, and then surgery is in the red mode, and so on. So this is what doctors think about. They don't really think about value, they don't think about cost, we don't think about uh, process and all that. We think about what's going to happen uh, to our patients in terms of cure. And so that brings you to value, and, and people have begun to look at that as an issue in, in judging the merits of different treatments in, in uh, medicine. And one of the people I've been influenced in the, by in the last five years is the work of Michael Porter, who's a competitive strategy um, uh, professor at Harvard Business School, and he and the Karolinska his group and the Karolinska group have gotten together in the last 10 years and started to bend their minds to how do we improve um, competition in healthcare and overall output. And, and what, what he distills his, his idea down to is the whole idea is if we're not keying on value in healthcare, then we're, we're missing the boat, whatever else we're doing. And he defines value as the patient's outcome achieved divided by or associated with the cost to achieve those outcomes. Um, so that has spawned the whole idea, an area of value-based healthcare, which is gaining currency all over the globe, uh, which I think is a terrific idea. But how does that relate to the more traditional ideas in, in health policy, and how do we, how, how do we relate um, value-based healthcare to the other metrics that, we, that health economists and therefore the payers and the policymakers would, would, would use? So what, what Porter decided to do and he advised us to do is let's just start measuring outcomes that are important to people. And they picked a number of conditions. And happily for me, one of the first conditions they picked was localized prostate cancer. And he formed a group called ICHAM, which is the International Consortium for Health Outcomes Measurement. And we, a group was put together globally to look at what outcomes are, should we be me measuring for patients who have prostate cancer in the early stages. 
And so the group met and we produced a set of outcomes, some of which have to do with uh, the prostate cancer itself and some have to do with quality of life and side effects um, uh, from the various treatments. Again, I apologize if you can't read all the detail on this, you don't have to. It's just the idea is that we had a group internationally of surgeons, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, diagnosticians who said, okay, this is what we should be measuring and these are the scales or metrics we should use to do that. So Porter suggests we should optimize around value and, and he defines value as uh, outcomes divided by costs. But what outcomes and, and what should we measure? And we'll come on to that in a second. And, and thankfully now, having met Brendan and Eamon and others in the, uh, Paddy and others in the faculty here, I began to ask and, and become exposed to how does everybody else judge outcomes that are, are worthy in, in health economics and, and where do, how does that lead to policy? And it turns out we, we, we optimize on different things in value, although maybe they're the same thing. This is what we're here to tease out a little bit. We optimize on health states, uh, for example, using cost-benefit analysis, uh, cost uh, effectiveness evaluation, cost utility evaluation. These are the metrics that health economists, I think, use uh, to make these determinations of value and which is better treatment and so forth. And then we optimize on the thing that really did my head in for a few months is this uh, idea of utility, which I thought initially was a cup of coffee after Brendan's first lecture. But <laughs> I, I now know a little bit more about utility and I think it's a really key area for us as medics to get our heads around because it really is the kind of metric of success or failure or scale that I think we can use. And when you delve into that, you find there's different kinds of utility and it, it doesn't do your head wreck any, any good at all. But, but uh, I'll come back to that a little bit later. So w different people optimize around different things. And that's, I didn't know that as a doctor. I didn't realize that this is what the health economists were advising our, our, our policy makers on. So then the question is, how do we link value-based healthcare with the more traditional health economic uh, metrics and measurements? And that's what I'm going to try to do, which could fail miserably, but here we go. So the, the outcomes that you have to check when you're looking for outcomes for value, you have to know who you're, who you're uh, working with. So first off, your patients. It's very different doing a hip replacement on a 55-year-old rugby player with, with a bad hip versus a 90-year-old osteoporotic female who cracks her hip um, you know, at late in life. Obviously, your outcomes are going to be dictated upon the risk characterization of your patients. That has to be defined. Then each outcome has to be measured by disease. You can't, there's not one set of outcomes that's going to, even though we measure slips and falls in the hospital and line sepsis, that doesn't help a prostate cancer guy know whether he's getting the right treatment or not. So you have to look at the disease metrics like I showed you early on. Then you have to measure the chances of harm, which comes down to how physicians uh, group side effects. And then the key one here, which is kind of really uh, obsessing, or we're all obsessing on is uh, appropriately, is you have to measure what the patient considered to be a good outcome, the so-called patient reported outcome measures or PROMs. And finally, you've got to ha get a handle on costs. So we did this on our own group over the last decade or so. I've done, I'm going to focus on brachytherapy, which is a type of radiation where we put radioactive sources or seeds into a prostate gland for cure. So it's a one-day procedure as opposed to seven and a half weeks of external radiation or surgery. So we looked at our, we've, we've implanted about 1,300 patients here in the last 10 or 11 years. And we analyzed our first 600 patients for survival first and then for relapse. And you can see on the bottom left here, they all, thank goodness, survive. I mean, the death from prostate cancer is less than 1% because they're so early in the diagnosis. So you can't use survival as a metric to help you choose value or quality. And then we look at recurrence-free survival, and again, happily, they're all recurring, or they're all surviving quite nicely without recurrence, not all of them. If you look at their risk profiles, you find the patients with the lowest risk do very well, almost 95, 97, 98% at five or six years. The intermediate risk is in the middle curve, and then the highest risk patients are in the lower curve. So people are relapsing, but you have to know your risk profile of your patients. So then we started looking at the outcomes to do with their side effect profile, and this is the famous Florence Nightingale, and she had, uh, obviously the PROM scales in, in, in her day were, were a lot simpler than the nursing uniforms, I think, were. She had three basic states. She had relieved, unrelieved, or dead, uh, which is nice and easy, and I kind of wish we had a simple PROM scale like that now, because now we have something very different. 
And this is one of them, the EPIC CP questionnaire, which is the one-page version of a 28-page uh, questionnaire. And EPIC is only one of uh, dozens of, of metrics that you could pick. This is why ICHOM, I hate to use all these acronyms, but ICHOM tried to focus us in on picking a few metrics that we could all use. But in this, you'll see that it looks at urinary, bowel, sexual, and general domains, because those are the things that are affected when you uh, either operate or, or radiate patients. So we looked at our EPIC domains, and we looked at our urinary domains, and we put people through a slew of patient-reported outcome metrics by paper, where they fill in the... I thank my team for this. They fill in the, pa the patients will put the numbers in boxes, and then we take the uh, metrics and we analyze them, and we need biostatisticians to do that work. Um, and we come up with mean quality of life scores, in this case around urinary function. When the curve goes up, it's they're experiencing problems, and when they go back down, they're actually getting better. So you can see we can show over three years people get temporary problems and usually they go away. So we can, uh, we can get those metrics from the patients. And this is the EPIC version. And again, the five panels on the right-hand side refer to urinary incontinence, urinary obstruction, bowel trouble, sexual problems, and general problems. And you can see you can measure those uh, changes. And in fact, they're statistically significant. So we're picking up real signal and we know what's happening to our patients. That's the state of the art in the clinic. And these are two patients that are papers that were published on this topic in prostate cancer in none other than the New England Journal, one in 2008, and another one I'll show you in 2016, about two months ago. And you can see that's what they're doing. They're looking at, look at these curves. One is uh, surgery on the left, radiotherapy in the middle, brachy on the right. And they're just basically tracking out the outcomes by patient quality of life and giving us those numbers. <coughs> I think that's fine, but does that really tell patients anything? This is the more recent paper from a month ago, and we haven't moved on one whit. New England Journal, patient reported outcome measures. This is our version of quality in 2016, the measuring quality. But how does that get back to cost effectiveness? Well, obviously, we've got to look beyond that to some degree to other metrics of quality so we can we can relate this to CEA C -E or CUA. And once you start looking at that, you come up with this great concept of the quali, which is another head wrecker for me uh, when I first heard about it. But I think I'm getting my head around it now. And the quality, it turns out, when you look at it, uh, relates to what you're optimizing, and that is utility. Um, and then op utility, when you try to measure that in prostate cancer, we find, actually, I, can't, I haven't done an exhaustive look, but there's very little actual measurements of utility on real patients. I could find two papers so far and I'm still looking. So really, everything that you look at at Qualys relates back to these, uh, a relatively small amount of data. So here's my kind of money shot here. I live or die on this slide. I'm sorry it looks awful, but this is the kind of process I'm trying to, we're trying to go through. So we started with Porter's equation, which is outcomes divided by cost and that's value. But then the outcome has to be a quality of life outcome because everybody's surviving, thank goodness, so we can't differentiate on that. And the real, diff the real nub of the quality of life comes from the patient, so that focuses on PROM. So quality of life equals a patient reported outcome measure. But then you've got to take qua pr PROMs and convert them to qualies, and qualies um, uh, relate to utility, and utility then relates to how we measure that delta in utility with the treatment. And this comes down to, how do we do that? And it turns out there are methods called TTO, trans time trade-offs and standard gambles. And who is actually judging these, these changes in, in quality is really important. If members of the public do it in reference to the future, they seem to overestimate the benefits or, or decrements in treatment. If patients do it, they seem to uh, underestimate potentially. And people adapt with time. So it turns out this is a bit of a moving target, and how do we incorporate that into our thoughts? So here's my take home, for good or bad. I hope I'm still on time here, Brendan. Um, if you're going to get into the business of defining qualities for anything other than uh, cost of new drugs, like the NCPE are, are, are appropriately doing, I think you have to measure qualities that are disease, or you have to measure PROMs that are disease specific. And it's not just, you can't just lump all prostate cancer together, for example, because all prostate cancer, unfortunately, includes both early diagnosed, largely curable phases, and then sadly, people who relapse and come back and we can't cure them, and they die of their disease. They have a very different set of quality of life issues going on, so they can't be measured on these with these metrics. So it has to be 
disease and condition specific. It has to be able to submit treatment specific because the surgeon worries about different side effects than the radiation oncologist does. You then have to get domain specific because we all cause differences in urinary, bowel, sexual, and general health, and they have to be measured uh, separately. And then you've got to get into the business of how we judge quality of life and how we measure that so we can factor it into a cost effectiveness or cost utility analysis. The final bit is cost itself, and this is a, another gnarly topic, I, I realize, but if, if Rochelle uh, Burns a paper looking at cost and estimating the cost of prostate cancer in Ireland in 2010, she, as most people do, took a top-down approach, dividing it into the different phases of treatment and the different things you can do, and then looking at the total spend on healthcare and coming up with these numbers. But there is a different way to do this, and I'm glad to see Stephen Coyne with me, at, or here this morning, who worked with me on this in GUH, where we looked at a bottom-up approach. If we just measure everybody's time and activity engaged in treating the prostate cancer, maybe we'll get a, a, a handle on the true costs of what, what we're spending, what Mary has to the proportion of her budget when she decides that, or one of, one of her doctors decides to do surgery versus radiation or brachy, how much of Mary's budget is chewed up by that decision? And is that okay? And so you can actually do this, and I'm just skip on in the interest of time to some of the work that we're beginning to do looking at, say, the implications of deciding external beam radiation uh, versus brachy. This is in a public hospital, so you know, no gain to picking one of these over the other. But you can see there's a 7,500 uh, bill to Morris Power and, and GUH when, when we pick external beam radiotherapy, and there's a 5,000 bill when we pick brachy. But the outcomes and the survivals are the same, and arguably the quality of life is the same with both. So should we be doing both? Is, is that in the hospital's best interest if we want to get best use for our money? So what we're doing here is uh, using Galway uh, patients in real world patients, uh, Brendan, uh, with prostate cancer who are getting a type of radiation who have a very narrow focus and trying to define a pathway that will compare value with cost benefit or cost utility evaluations and see if we can't uh, when, when the Minister for Health is making a decision on new drugs in cancer or cystic fibrosis or hepatitis C, he has a very transparent process with, uh, uh, directed well by the NCPE and everybody knows the rules and it comes down to is it cost effective uh, on, on that uh, basis and the Minister for Health can get clear guidance that the pharmaceutical companies uh, understand and, and everybody understands as to whether it is or it isn't versus our budget. But nothing else in the health system gets subjected to that scrutiny, I would submit. And I think we have to, as clinicians, change that because we've got to understand any more than Brendan having us in, in health economy, economics classes. I think as doctors, we really do need to understand how policy is made and, and what, how decision makers try to grapple with these choices. So in summary, uh, I think we can derive a cost utility analysis, unless you tell me otherwise uh, uh, after this talk, and we can develop a quality, and we can make that quality specific to, to a condition, which, is, uh, which really Porter says you have to do to define value. It must be condition focused. We, can, we should consider quality over time because it changes. I mean, after radiation, you can get side effects that take years to evolve. And it's not just good enough to do your treatment and kick the patient back to the GP and let him deal with what happens. I uh, do think we need to incorporate uh, much more traditional cost effectiveness models in our, in our judgments in hospitals. I think most of all patients need transparency. They need to know what's going on in each hospital in terms of real outcomes. I think the payers need transparency so that we can help them make sensible decisions. I do think we can bring competition into it and I do think Port is right. And I just I have to leave you with two quick slides. One is if you drive from, from Galway to Cork, which I do a lot, and you stop for a cup of tea in Charleville, which is a good place to stop, if you go out the back of the garage, you'll see there's a car wash there. And I saw this the other day, and I couldn't resist it, because I think some of the messages that come out of our hospitals you know, are equally muddied. Um, I, how do people know what the heck is they're getting when they walk through the door? I'd like to think we can make this much more transparent, and it should be much more obvious what's really good. Um, and I put this up in deference to the guy second from the left here who we sadly lost a couple of weeks ago, Anthony Foley. But it should be more obvious to patients what they're getting. It should be more obvious to the pairs what they're getting. And I think our challenge as doctors is to get in amongst you 
and try to figure out a better way to measure these things so that we can do, deliver better care. In closing, I just want to thank what's become an, uh, quite a big team now, um, uh, which I'm delighted to acknowledge here, uh, the teams of people treating the patients at GOH and the Galway Clinic. Um, we couldn't have done this without them. Uh, Rachel uh, Lee, who helped us pull the PROM data together a couple of years ago with Brenda Dooley. Uh, Ruth Corcoran is now uh, pulling, doing a prospective th um, uh, study looking at outcomes in, in healthcare and prostate cancer. Uh, Davood is helping us with the biostatistics, and Davood is here. And Brendan, Paddy, and Kieran, and all at, at the Health Economics for trying to clear up our thinking, which is which I hope uh, we're doing. Uh, Dermot and Martin O'Donnell for running really terrific programs here and linking doctors with uh, the health economists. So, uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>